give that clap to the Lord, everybody. Man, what a great crowd here tonight. But I just want to inform you, the crowd's bigger tonight than it was last Wednesday night. I just wanted to let you know that. Of course, I'm picking on my mother. There's nobody like my mother. <clears throat> drove her to Dallas, drove her to Dallas Sunday afternoon, and we came back yesterday, and I survived it. Took my 97-year-old mother to see my 94-year-old aunt. Now, folks, that's some DNA right there. <laughs> You're such great people. Roger Allison is watching, and I believe the camera's up there. Would everybody turn around and look at that camera up there and say, Roger, we love you. Roger. We love you, buddy. Thank you for your faithfulness. Been a faithful man of God. We believe in still for your healing in Jesus' name. And I want pastor, our pastor to know Sunday morning's message is not just one of his best. That is one of the better messages you will hear. I thank God for Sunday morning's message. It was great. And thank you for coming tonight. Pray for the Messiah cast. I, I asked them not to come tonight. Some of them are here, but I wanted them to rest. But they need rest. They've worked so hard. And then they start back tomorrow night and they go, Tomorrow night, Friday night, twice, Saturday, off Sunday, and then it's Monday on through until the next Monday and Tuesday. So let's pray for our cast. They're working very hard and giving everything they have. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. You always want to bring your Bible. Now, I like the hard copy, but I'm not going to get on you if you got one on your phone. You need to make sure that I'm telling the truth. When I read, make sure I'm reading out of the Bible. Amen? I'm going to read out of the Bible. It's going to be up there, in fact. So we gotten used to that, so I shouldn't have gotten on you for that. But anyway, nothing like the Bible. That's your sword. Amen. devil gets on you, you want to hack him to death, so make sure you got it with it. Let's read together. Can we do that? Yeah. Finally, my brethren. Time out. Finally. With this country so divided, with everything so messed up, be strong in the Lord. Now, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not. This is important that you understand what I'm going to emphasize tonight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness. That's high places, not low places, not medium places, but they're high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, okay, let's say that, and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins gird with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I want tonight to speak to you from the subject of spiritual warfare in the heavenly. Spiritual warfare in the heavenly. Would you put your Bibles down and with a shout that would scare him to death. Now don't sit down yet. I got something else I want to do. That's just great. Now, before you see it, turn and shake somebody's hand, look them square in the eye and say, the devil's going to have a bad night. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Oh. 
may be seated. <clears throat> First of all, I want to clarify the essence of this war. Uh, let me state that this war is all about uh, that you may understand and the battle and its core, what's at the heart of are the center of this war and understand it's spiritual. It is not a physical battle. If it was that way, we got a bunch of men in this church that would take care of the devil if that's the way it was. But it's spiritual. To a degree that you and I understand and relate to it on a spiritual level, to the degree that we can make sense of it and be prepared for the battle that we have to fight in the heavenlies. Perhaps a definition that will help you on this subject tonight is spiritual warfare is that cosmic conflict in the invisible angelic realm that is being waged in the context of the visible physical realm. So let me say that again. I was right on that. It's the invisible where the fight's going on with the physical here in spiritual warfare. I am referring to a cosmic conflict occurring in the invisible angelic realm that is being flushed out or worked out here in the physical realm. Or to put it another way for you, the cause of the war is something you can't see. You are fighting in the context of an invisible battle that involves invisible beings, yet they're taking it out on you and me. It's hard enough to fight somebody that you see, but it's even harder to try to fight something you can't see. And at the core of the battle is something you can't see. Because we're told in these few verses, when we read earlier, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. To put it another way or to lay another foundation, you and I are in a battle fighting beings that we can't see. Yet their effect on us, we can see. We can't see who we fighting but we can see what they do to us. Paul the Apostle says you make a grand mistake if you think people are your problem. I got a problem with that person. He said you're making a mistake if you have a problem with somebody. He says in verse 12, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That means people. As bad as some people has treated you, you're not wrestling against them. They are merely the conduits through which the evil spirit may work. All of us have been in situations trying to change people who are not doing right. Maybe not understanding that the people who are not doing right by us could very well be under control of a person that they can't control. Until you and I learn to understand that what happens through people, that does not exonerate their wrongdoings, don't get me wrong. But what happens through people, it will change if you get this understanding. What happens through people, through you, through me, through people upon us, has at its core something that is much grander than that. And that is where the whole spiritual battle comes in. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4 writes, The heavens do rule. What takes place upon earth, everything that takes place on earth, was precipitated by something that took place in the heavenly. And until you and I address the spiritual problem, you will never be able to address the physical problem. So when you look at the passage of 6, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, we understand, I want you to say this, people... I know you, some won't say it because you think it is, but I'm going to convince you before it's over. It's not. People, People. is not my, not my problem. 
Paul said, it's not against principalities or powers, but against the rulers and darkness in spiritual wickedness in high places, which means spiritual realm. Whatever is going on in your world or your life has gone on, is going on or will go on, is rooted, first of all, in a spiritual realm in high places. If you don't know how to navigate that realm, you will never get your problem fixed in the physical until we learn to operate in the spiritual. Because when we get it fixed in the spiritual, it's going to help us negotiate the physical. So warfare, you've heard it a lot. My dad used to preach on it a lot. My mother spoke it on a lot. Spiritual warfare can simply be defined as the conflict in the invisible realm that affects what you're going through in the visible realm. It is the battle in the unseen that is responsible for the battles in the seen. Whatever is happening in the world of your five senses, flesh and blood, has been created in a world that you cannot see. But if you can't navigate that world, you will never be able to fix this world. So right now, I want you to forget everybody around you. I want to forget all those that's hurt you in the past. I want you to forget somebody that you're mad at right now. And I want us to get to thinking about the spiritual heavenly realm that God wants us to learn about tonight. Because most of our attempts to fix the things that we are going through in this world is using worldly means. I thank God for our doctors, we got to have them. I thank God for our attorneys, we got to have them. I thank God for our pastors and counselors, we got to have them. But a lot of times we rely totally on the physical to try to take care of something that God could help us with in the spiritual realm. It seems like to me what is happening there is the problem is it gets manifested here. All the physical world does is manifest that spiritual world. And you and I are unaware of how that world works. Then all of you and me are left to deal with all the physical problems we have to deal with. But the problem is the physical can't fix the physical. So if you want to fix what started in the spiritual, what is messing your physical realm up at this time, you have to go back to the spiritual, which is the location of where it originated. Now, what the demonic world doesn't want you to know and doesn't want me to know is they don't want you to know that what you live in the world of the five senses, you can't live there. The Bible calls that the natural man. You can't fix this as the natural man. The devil wants you to live in the world of seeing and touching and tasting and hearing and smelling. And he wants you to function by those five senses. He wants you to try to fix everything with those five senses. He says that we are not wrestling against that, though. God says, hold on here, Anthony. You're not wrestling against that. It's not flesh and blood, but it's principalities and spirits. It's things in the heavenly that you are warring against. It's the strategy of the devil to let me tell you what devils and demons don't want you to know tonight. They don't want you to know their methodology and their schemes. Because if we ever figure out the works of the demonic and the spiritual world, the devil will be totally wiped out, not from tempting you, but from winning in your life. The devil I'm preaching about tonight is more than a knock on your door with a bag handed out, trick or treat with somebody there with horns on in a red suit. The devil is more than Hollywood. He wants you to think about him that way. And you never see that horns or pitchfork or red jumpsuit. You don't have to take him seriously as long as you don't ever see that. He doesn't want you to figure him out. But I'm going to lay down a principle tonight of his scheme. His scheme is to deceive and to trick. 
He doesn't want you to see him what he really is. So he comes to you looking like something else. The Bible said he can even look like light. That's what he said. Mother, you go ahead, mother, preach. I helped you last week. Come on. He transforms himself into an angel of light. That's why in the garden he came as that snake. They didn't, now we know what it is. They didn't know what was going on there. So the only power that Satan and demons have is the power that we give them. The only power of a born-again person that the devil has is the power that you give him. They have already been defeated. They have already lost. That's not just a song we sing. You'll know this. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold her down. He done won the battle. But the problem is, if they're not defeated by us accepting that, then we're not winning. The only power that they have is the power that I grant them. The only reason Satan could take over planet Earth is because Adam and Eve gave him permission to do it. Demons need permission before they can affect your life. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm going through. I rode with mother for two days. You don't know what none of us are facing. We're all facing things in our life, from kids to grandkids that we're up against. We're all facing things. And through the worldview and through the schemes, the deceptive programs of the devil, the devil operates by consent and cooperation. Some people say, uh, well, so many people are so demon conscious. Well, the problem to me is so many of us are demon unconscious. We don't understand that some of the things we're fighting is not that person or our neighbor or the, or the job or the boss. or It's a spirit that's working through that that's trying to get through us. The people are real. Flesh and blood are real. But it's just not the root of the problem. So he wants consent. He needs our consent because his power to work against you has to have your consent. Well, I've never heard of that. Well, you're hearing it tonight because you got a name and you got the blood and you got the word. And I've come to notify you all three of those has power over any spirit that's coming against you. So that's why he says, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. That's why he says, be strong in the Lord. And in, I didn't give them my scripture, so let's be, with it, be patient with them. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Translation, not your strength, not your might, not your power. Why can't I get him off of my back? Because we've been trying to use our strength. And my human strength doesn't work in that ram. That ram can't go against his strength. The devil will take us down if we try to do it with our strength. But he doesn't have a chance if we'll keep it in the spiritual realm. Please notice we're going to Ephesians 6. If you have your Bibles, go to Ephesians 6. Put it up on your phone because I want you to follow me through those scriptures there. Notice what he says over and over in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Would you throw that up there for me? I know I didn't have that for you. You got it for me. Thank you very much. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to. That's the word I want you to key in on right there. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, if you don't mind for me, please. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to 
withstand in the evil day and having done all, and having done all, stand. What I'm going to tell you tonight is being brought out in these three verses is you see in one word that's common, stand. Don't run, stand. Don't let the devil scare you, stand. Don't flee, stand. Whatever circumstance, stand. Verse 14, let's read verse 14 together. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Don't go anywhere. Hold on to what you've got. Stay where you are. Don't be running around looking for the next revival. Don't be jumping from here to there. Just say, I'm standing. You're not going to put me on the run. I'm going to put you on the run. You're not going to scare me. I'm going to scare you. Stand firm means stay in the area that has already brought you the victory. The only reason nobody should stand what I'm preaching tonight is if you've never had a victory in your life. But if you've ever had a victory, if you've ever overcome anything, if you've ever come through any valley, if you've ever fit, uh, beat the devil before, he's saying, if I did it before, I can do it again. If I've ever answered a request for you, I can answer a request for you again. I'm going to nail it, and I'm going to nail it, and I'm going to nail it. Because the older I get, uh, uh, I get more like Daddy. I keep repeating myself. I get to own him. I said, Daddy, you told me that four or five times. So forgive me if I tell you that over and over again. We're not going to go anywhere. Whatever you did the last time you went through something, you're still here. That's what y'all just look up to the Lord and say, I'm still here. I'm still standing. He didn't get me last time, and he's not going to get me this time. I'm still standing. He said, stand firm. In other words, stay in the area that has already brought you the victory. You've already won before. Do what you did that time. Do it again. Whatever you were doing then when you won the last victory, do it again. You don't need to try something new. Just stand in what has worked through your walk with God. Stand. He said, don't go leaning to your own understanding. Don't go trying to figure this out yourself. Let me have it. Don't go there. Stay in the spot where victory has already been achieved. Don't go to your own victory because you will leave the spot. Don't try to work it out yourself. You will leave the spot. I'm not getting off of here. I'm standing right here because the last time he healed me of double pneumonia, I'm not moving from here. The last time that I was sick with, with a virus, God healed me. The last time that I had a stroke in 2017, thanks to my doctor and thanks to God, I'm still standing. So I'm just going to keep standing. It doesn't mean you're not going to go through things. It just means you're going to stand. I'm here. I'm not going to let anything shake me. I'm not going to let anything bother me. And the closer you get to Calvary, the harder he's going to fight you. But just keep on standing. That's right, Andrew. He said, I love this. I, I love Ephesians 6. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power, the strength of his might. So what happened? What happened when Jesus Christ died? The Bible says in Colossians 2 verse 10, and ye are complete in him. You're fulfilled. You're complete in him, which is the head. We get the, okay, let's read together. I, I want to read the Bible tonight. And ye are There's nothing, thank you, mother. She's right. There's nothing else to add to you. Give me this. There's nothing else to give you. You complete. You're complete in him. There's no additives there. It doesn't need another adjective or a verb. 
You're complete in him. Colossians 1 and 13. Here's what you're complete in. Colossians 1 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. When you stand with him, you get translated with him. Hebrews 2, 14, that through death, Jesus might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He rendered Satan powerless. He stripped him. That's why if we can keep the war up there, you're going to win. You keep the war down here, you may get your nose pretty bloody. But when he starts jumping on you, you take it up there. Hey, Father. Hey, Jesus. Hey, right here, Lord. You've already handled this for me. We got a stage built over there with a cross and an empty tomb. You've already handled this for me, Lord. I'm going to just keep on standing here. What it basically is saying is he's no longer in control. The devil is no longer in control. In fact, Colossians 2.15 says, having small principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he conducted a victory parade in heavenly places. He went public with his victory. And what we need to have tonight is a parade. I would love, I don't have time tonight because i got more to preach, but I'd love just to have everybody that God's done something great for just get up and let's start our own parade. Put on some music back there. We just start parading around, throwing the candy out to everybody. Hey, how y'all doing? I've been blessed. God's been good to me. God's touched me. We're going public with what God's done for me. I want the world to know the devil don't have any authority over me. Only thing he can do is what I give him permission to do. And I'm not going to let him get me nor my kids nor my family. Yeah, but my kids, what I'm going through, hey, God's got all that. They've been dedicated, been born again. Your kids are going to heaven. You don't have a right to say that. I do have a right to say that. Train up a child in the way they should go. They will not depart. It may not look it right now, but they're going to be a part. Your kids are going to be saved. Your family's going to be saved. So Ephesians 1, and 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says that everything is now under his feet. Well, the devil's been on my back. Well, get him off your back and get him under your feet. Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ has defeated him once and for all. Therefore, he cannot whip you with power. The only way he can whip you is by permission. That's a powerful line. He can't beat you with his power. The only way he can beat you is with permission that's been handed to him by you, by your own strength of giving up what works. And I'm going to talk about that, and that's prayer and fasting. You just keep on standing. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. What is his power gives? Not what your power can conjure up or work up, but it's his power. Satan doesn't want you to know that he's already been whipped. Because you will treat him differently. If I could get you leaving here tonight, acting like what you say you believe, I got to get you acting like, not you, us. That was a wrong statement. Not we or you, us. If I can get us leaving here, acting like what we say we believe, you will look at the devil totally different than you've been looking at him. Now let me just say one thing. Don't go looking for him. I got enough going on besides go looking for him. Well, where's the devil? I just want, not me. You take him on. I'll let you have him. I'm going to beat him. I mean, if he comes, I'm going to win, but I ain't just wanting to fight every day, okay? So I'll let you have those battles. There would be no fear of the devil 
or what he can do if we understood that he's already a defeated foe and if we lived our life that way. So stand firm in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. <clears throat> You're not trying to win. Forget it. I'm going to make it. You're not trying to win. He's already won. You're a winner. If you don't let him convince you that you're not, you're a winner. You are to view your life through the eyes of a victorious Christ, not through the eyes of something you're trying to win. God has already played this thing. The game's already been played. It's not even the two-minute warning. The game's over. You won. We just got to finish out and get off the field. He's already put it on tape. That victory has already been declared. Victory's already been won. So when you talk about yourself or when you talk to somebody else, if you're a born-again believer, you're not supposed to be talking as one trying to locate victory. You're supposed to be one talking as one who has already won the victory. Because you're using the Lord's strength, not your strength. Victory is yours. Don't tyke like, I'm, oh, I'm just trying to make it. I hope tomorrow is better than today. One day, this is all going to pass. Mother's liking that. I think God just doesn't want me here. I hope next year is better than this year. I hope next week's better than this week. And we're talking as people. I do the same thing. I'm not rebuking you. I am, but I'm also rebuking me. We all do this. We're human nature. So we're talking uncertainties. We're talking hopefulness and desire. I just hope we can do this. And, and I told you this story. I told you just the last time I preached, my daddy again. We was leaving this, this place, Brother Powell's funeral. And mother just in the back seat of crying. Of course, you know, tell me when mother's not crying. I mean, she, oh, God, I got to see that. Well, I want to see that. I know, I know. But with leaving, and I look back, and she said, Anthony, he's made it. I just hope I can make it. <laughs> what? <laughs> just hope you can make it. This isn't a hope thing, folks. I'm saved. Quit living in all the fear you're just hoping. That's, that's way, 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 way old time. I can just hold on to the end. I'm determined to hang on. No. Just give him, you don't have permission in my life. You can come against me all you want to, but you don't have permission to do that. And the more you do that, the more I'm going to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We quote this verse, and everybody knows it, outside of most of you, Acts 2.38. It's the famous verse among the apostolics. And I'll start it, and I guarantee you may not be able to quote maybe no other scripture in the Bible, but you can finish this one. Greater is... Oh, man. Really? Is that, is, was that in your Bible? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, then let's don't give him permission to think he's greater than what's inside of us. Let's don't insult our God by thinking there's something outside of us that can defeat us. You let the devil know, I got something I may not be able to, but I got something inside of me that can take care of everything that's coming against you. How about this one? I'll start it and you finish it. I'm going to be a little sassy here. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself up. We're more than conquerors. Yet some of us walked in here wondering if we was going to make tomorrow. Right? No, you didn't amen that, but I'm right. That's what we call religious speech. 
That's what we call Pentecostal catechism. That's not victory on parade. We are more than overcomers. And greater is he that's he that's in the world. So what I hope I can get you doing here is when you leave this place, don't you go looking for him. You tell him to stay as far away you as he can get. But if he does show up, you just punch him as hard as you can with the word, the blood, and the name and say, I'm not giving you permission to take up possession in my life. I'm not giving you permission to come near me. I am not giving you permission. Because when you bring Jesus into this realm, when you bring what he accomplished, saying you've been defeated, you're telling me I've got to have a drug or I've got to have alcohol or I've got to be immoral or you're a liar or you're addicted or you've been in truth so long you forgot what God can do? No, 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 no. I am telling you, you have the authority over all of that. I thank God for our seven program. I thank God for the steps. I believe in it. We need to work it. But I'm going to tell everyone that's been bound by a chemical. I'm going to tell every one of us that's been bound by fear. Mother, I'm going to tell me and you that's been bound by worry. I'm going to tell every one of us the devil can do nothing unless we give him permission. We have taken his tomb and we've taken his cross and we've relegated it to 2,000 years ago. But let me tell you, the devil hadn't come up with any new tricks or new gadgets, and I'm not going to try to come up with them either. You just keep standing on what got the last time. You keep praying and fasting and worshiping and praising God, coming to church, being faithful to the kingdom of God. And if you're tired of being trapped in the realm, you've got to start using this realm to fix it because that spiritual realm can fix anything you're in. He's supposed to be trying to hold your hostage. He can't hold us hostage. We hold him hostage. Let him know the next time he comes around, you're going to get a hold of him. You're going to put him in the back bedroom, and he's going to stay there for a few minutes. Discipline him. He's not supposed to be running our lives, running our emotions, running our passions. If he's doing that, then we got to start standing stronger. We have to stand strong in our position. Okay, what did I do? Well, he's going to tell you in verse 11. You ready? Ever say, okay, pastor, you told me to stand. Well, I'm getting beat up. What did I do? Okay, let's go. He tells us in verse 11, what are we supposed to do? Not a half of them. Not a third of them. Not some of them. Put on the whole armor of God. In other words, don't go to war partly dressed. In the spiritual war against the devil, put on the whole armor of God. Just don't put on a few pieces here and there. The armor of God is our spiritual resources. The message tonight is all about what you're wearing. He says, put on the full armor of God. So let's get it straight. It's not my armor. Let's get it straight. It's not your armor. Let's get it straight. It's not my clothes and it's not your clothes. Because God lives in a realm that he knows what we're supposed to wear. God knows how to put the clothes out there for us. Now when I got older, when I was a kid, because this great mother of mine dressed me. But when I even got older, 10, 12. I got up getting ready to get married. 1920, my mother was laying my clothes out for me. That's a joke. But my mother took care of me. When I got older, my mother didn't dress me. She dressed me when I was a babe. She clothed me when I was a babe. But I finally reached a point spiritually, I'm using the physical spiritually, where I could dress myself. And he said, you don't dress it in your clothes. He said, put on the armor of God. I want you to put on the whole armor. I'm not saying you won't be tempted. I'm not saying there won't be problems. I'm not saying there won't be frustrations. There will be. But if you have on the armor of God, he said, he said, we shall suffer persecution. He said that. You are going to face that. But I'm saying he doesn't have the last word. 
I'm saying you may lose a battle, but you're going to win the war. I've lost some battles, but I've won the war. They will no longer be the dictator, the ruler, that thing that's controlled you, that obsession, that temper, that anger, that depression, that oppression, the thing that's had us down, the emperor that's been ruling our lives. They may show up, but they will no longer have the final say-so because you are dressed for success when you put on the whole armor of God. There are six items of apparel that we must wear in that scripture. Everybody say six. Five are for defense. One is for offense. There are two categories. If you're not writing it down, please write it in your head. There are two categories that he lists. The first three and the last three are different. Notice how he lines it out. The first sets all begin with the word having. Verse 14, stand, having your loins gird, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They all begin with having. That's what you have. That's what's on you. That's what's there. But the next three don't begin with have. The next three verbs in verse 16 is taking the shield of faith. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. He moves from have to take. Six times, two separate categories of three. The first group is have. What does have mean? It's from the verb to be. It means a state of being. It means the first three you wear are the time you never take them off. You wear the first three 24 Hours a day. The last three you pick as they are needed. You take them as you face something that you need to fight. You have to get those three. So whenever you need the last three, you go get them. But you don't take off the first three. But this is the point that I want to get you to understand. God gives the armor, but he doesn't. Put them on you. God does not dress you. He gives you the armor to dress yourself. This is my coat. Now, I've given Roy things before, but Roy, you're not getting this coat. So get up here. But if I give this him, he has just put on my cloak. Okay? But it's a shame. If I say, Roy, this is your coat, buddy, when you leave tonight, take it with you. That's not the truth. But if I had on an older one, Roy, there's that coat. Put it on, take it with you. And he walks out and leave it? That's nobody's fault but him. You getting the picture? And the Lord says, I've given you this armor. Now I've laid it down here. Here it is. There you go, buddy. I'll even throw one over you there. There you go. Now you got to get up, take that armor, and put it on. Oh God, please dress me. God's not going to dress you. He will not dress you. He will give you the entire attire, but he will not dress you. You have to put on the whole armor of God. So how does it work? And I'm not much longer. How does it work? In grace, God has supplied everything you need. Everybody say, in grace, God has supplied everything I need. 
That's why we're asking God sometimes for things that's already been supplied. Grace is all that God has already done. God can do nothing new for you or me than what He's already done. Because everything He's ever going to do for you 10 years from now, it's still already done. What God done for me just gets better. It may get better every day because you're getting a new revelation, but He's not doing any more than what He was able to do 10 years ago or 10 years from now. So to even ask God to bless you is a misnomer. Because Ephesians 1 and 3 says you have already been blessed with spiritual blessings. Blessed be the God, Ephesians 1 and 3, of the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in, there we are, heavenly places. You've already been blessed. You're asking for God to bless you. You're going to have to, I'm, just about every one of us is going to have to change our prayers. Oh, Lord, bless me. That's, a, that's an empty prayer. You've done been blessed. Just pray, oh, God, help me to get up and take the blessing that you've already blessed me with. Help me to leave here tonight to take the blessing that you've already given me. Help me understand to take the blessing that's already been given to me. Well, okay, Bishop, where are they located? They're located in heavenly places. They're not located down here. They're located in heavenly places. So let's get this straight. Everything that God is ever going to do for you, He's already provided it. Isn't that amazing? There is nothing that in... Ten years from now that you will need that he hadn't already done. It's called grace. What God has already provided, God has already given. What is our responsibility? Everybody says, his is grace. Mine is faith. Faith is reaching back to grace and grabbing what grace has already provided. Faith is reaching back to the spiritual so that it is made manifest in the physical. God won't do that for you. That's your responsibility. He's already provided the grace. Your faith is going to have to reach out and take what He has already done. I will grace supply your armor, but you must in faith take it. If faith doesn't put on grace, grace won't be beneficial to you. If I give this coat, I'm giving it away, it's yours, Roy. Not really, but it's yours, Roy. And if he leaves it here tonight, that's his problem. And there's nothing that God can bless you with 50 years from now that you're not already blessed with. You say, well, you don't know what I'm going to go through. And I don't know what I'm going to go through. But when we get there, we've already been blessed for it. We've already been blessed for it. Now, it's grace, not because it's not available. It's because we don't pick it up and wear it. It's already ours. I could buy you something and pay for it. But if you don't put it, use it, it ain't no good. So we're asking God for things He's already given, and I'm closing. We're asking God to do things that He's already done. That's something, isn't it? I think some of you's in shock. But it's done. We're asking God to accomplish victories He's already provided because faith hasn't grabbed it. We haven't gotten it. So tonight, from this point on, you start reaching for faith. And when the devil comes pounding on you, just call, call him that name, Jesus, 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 and then look back and say, faith, faith, faith. Remember Wednesday night at 8.05, March 15, I think. 8.05, I grabbed on to something, devil. I believed in it, but I wasn't practicing it. But bishops got me fired up and made me half mad. Now I'm going to fight you with what I got. Don't think I'm minimizing what you're going through. Please don't do that to me. I'm not minimizing what you're going through. But it's not nearly as big as what God can do with what you're going through. He can take care of it and He can fix it. I'm dressed to walk in success. 
I am built for success. Ephesians 6 and 18. How? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication in all prayers. We're to be praying always. It's amazing when the Lord was giving me all this. I said, Lord, my last message was on prayer. And the way he talks to me, I've never heard an audible voice. My father did, I didn't. It's just that intuition that I get. I said, God, I've talked prayer. Mother's talked prayer, prayer. He said, prayer. Prayer. Prayer language we understand. Prayer language the devil doesn't understand. Thus prayer is the means we engage the battle, the purpose for which we're armed to face the devil, to put on the armor of God, to prepare for the battle. Prayer. So you're telling me, prayer is the battle itself. God's word being our chief weapon, God used against Satan during his struggle, that Syrian war player uh, plan, God's chariots and horses. I preached about it last time I preached, 2 Kings 6. The Bible says, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes. And when that servant's eyes was open, he saw all those angelic forms. But you know what he did? He prayed. And when you pray, you see angels. Somebody asked me this afternoon, said, do you believe in seeing angels? I said, yes. I see one every day in Mickey. No, that's not the truth. She's got a little devil in her there. <laughs> Elisha, pray. Folks, prayer will take us through anything. Prayer will get you through anything. Well, I don't know how to pray like your mother. I don't have a prayer language like you. I can't pray like so-and-so. Brother Larry Clark and his group, there's a group that meets him every morning around 4.35. Every morning they're here at this prayer room. I don't have a prayer language like that. It's okay. It's very simple. It's like I was talking to your daddy. And some of you may not have a good relationship with your father, but whoever was the, the figure in your life, thank God I had a great relationship with my father. It's like talking to my daddy. I could ask my daddy for anything. If it wasn't going to hurt me, my daddy would try to provide it. Hey, Dad, I need this. So that's what you do with the Lord. Hey, Dad. Hey, hey, Daddy, I need this. You've already provided it. Now, I'm calling that blessing. Bishop told me you've already provided it. I need that provision right now. Send it on down, Lord. That's that song your mama used to sing. Send it on down, send it on down. Come on, Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it down. So we pray and we put on the whole armor of God. And you get up tonight with your shoulders thrown back. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care what you're up against. I don't care how hard you've been fighting. I want you to establish one thing with him before you walk out that building. You no longer. I have given you permission to mess with me and my bishop has opened my eyes. You don't have that permission anymore. So you leave me alone. You get away from me. Or if you don't, the Lord done kicked you out of heaven and one third of his angels with him. So that means my Lord still has two-thirds left. And the last time I thought two-thirds is more than one-third. Number one, my angels are going to whip your angels, and my Lord's going to whip you. So put it on. Get to calling on. Look at what it is and tell it, uh-uh, you ain't bothering me. If I can do one thing, I don't even care if you pray tonight. If you'll just throw your head back and say, man, I'm somebody. Right there. I'm somebody. When the president came down here and he was president, and I had the privilege of going out and spending the night in the White House and flew down with him in that, and I, I, you heard me say this, but the new ones haven't. And then when we got there, we got to the White House and we were getting ready to leave to go fly here for Messiah. He was coming to see Messiah. They gave you a pen. And, and the people here had pens, but they were all different colored pens. Some were red, some were blue. And the color of pen determined how close you got to get to the president. Those that were working on stage with the Messiah, they had a, a red pen. Those that were on staff that could be in the office, they had on a blue pen. But they had me a pen that was made of crystal. And there was only three of them. His chief of staff, one other man, and me had that pen on. And so he stopped in New Orleans. That was his reason to get to come to Alexandria to give a speech. And when he went to give that speech, they were, they were uh, stopping me and doing that. And I, I turned, because they hadn't seen it, and I just went... Oh, sorry, come on through. Yeah, yeah, right on through here. <laughs> go a little further, get here in my own place. And people I know, and they say, Reverend, you can't, but you can't go. <laughs> he 
You've been given a name that is above every name. And when he comes to take possession, when he comes to intimidate you, when he comes to try to take over you, I got the Lord on my side. Get on your feet and give a praise to God. You got the Lord on your side. You got the name that is above name. You got the word. You got the blood. You got the name. You're victorious. Victory. We got it. Tell him he don't have no right anymore. I'm not giving you permission. You've been coming because I let you come. You don't have a right to come to me. I'm a child of God and I got God on the inside of me. You come again, you mess with me anymore, you're going to get hurt, devil. The Lord's already bruised your head. He's going to crush it one day. It'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. You're a crushed foe. So until then, I'm going to crush you. Leave me alone. Leave my family alone. Leave my children alone. Praise him like he deserves to be praised. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. And beside him, there is no other. There is no God like our God. He's the first, he's the last. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning, he's the end. There's nobody like our God. Now, if you hadn't repented of your sins, we baptize people Sunday. And we may baptize people. You haven't been baptized in Jesus' name. Don't you leave here till you get baptized in Jesus' name. That's the shield that you put on. That's the thing that goes over you. Don't leave here till you've been baptized in Jesus' name. And if you have, man to man, woman to woman, we just prayed for ourselves. I want you to reach woman to woman or man to man or husband to wife. And I want you to lay your hands on them. And now you're not praying for yourself. I want you to pray for them that they'll stand. That's the prayer I want you to pray, okay? Pray that they will stand. Lift your voice. Come on, pray that they will stand. Pray that they will stand. I said, go ahead and pray through with somebody. Go ahead and release up in the name of Jesus with somebody. And you've done all to stand, stand. That's it. There's a spirit of prayer just flowing through here right now. Faith. Faith. Those of you on the web, don't leave yet. Those of you on the web, thank you for joining us. It's a privilege having you. I hope tonight's lesson blessed you. May God bless you and may you live on the hallelujah side. Thank you for joining POA. Join us Sunday at 10 o'clock. We're going to have a great time. God bless you, those of you on the web. Tonight.